Welcome to the first lab video for Engineering 3213 Digital Systems and Microprocessors. In this video, we're going to get started with Vivado and design a simple light switch for the Nexus 4 DDR development board. Whilst this is conceptually very simple, uh, this particular exercise is powerful because it provides us with a step-by-step -step guide on how to create a fully functioning FPGA design from nothing. This includes describing the behavioral logic of our light switch in Verilog, specifying connections to the Nexus 4 DDR's physical I.O. using constraints, and then synthesizing and implementing our design in Vivado before loading it onto the FPGA. The first thing that will appear when you launch Vivado is this window. And this allows us to create a project, open an existing project, or even open an example project. We're going to go ahead and create our first project. The first window that pops up simply informs us of the information required to complete or create a new project. In this case, we're going to name our project My First Project. And we're going to set the project location to be a directory somewhere well known. Uh, I'm not sure what the default is on your computer, but I've created a folder under my documents called FPGA, and I'm going to store my project files in a subdirectory called projects. Make sure that this little tick box is ticked because that'll make sure that all of the, the files that are created during your project are stored within a subdirectory called my first project. The next screen that comes up asks you to specify the project type. So there are a few options here, but the only one that we're ever going to be dealing with is RTL project. That stands for register transfer level project. Uh, the only other one that might be interesting for you is example project, because this provides you with a bunch of predefined templates created by Xilinx. We don't have any sources to specify at this time, so you might as well make sure that this checkbox is ticked. The next thing that Vivado asks you to do is to specify a thing called a default part. Now what this is, is the actual physical FPGA chip on whatever device you're targeting with your design. So this is important because, you know, we're using the Nexus 4 DDR development board um, and that has a particular FPGA on it. But if, for example, we're using a basis three, then it uses a different FPGA chip. And the reason this is important is because the different FPGAs will have a different number of pins uh, and they'll also have different pin assignments to the various I.O. on the development board. So in our case, we're using a Nexus 4 DDR and it has an Arctic 7 FPGA and we can specify that by changing the family. We also have knowledge of the package, which is a CSG324. That just means that the FPGA that we're targeting has 324 pins. The speed grade of the Nexus 4 DDR's FPGA is minus one, uh, and it doesn't actually have a specific temp grade. This is a temperature grade, for example, if the embedded application was to um, operate in harsh environments. So there are five options left available. Uh, the, if you look very carefully at the Nexus 4 DDR's FPGA chip, you'll see that the particular model number is XC7A100TCSG324-1. The only difference between the five available options is the amount of resources on the FPGA itself. Once you've finished, you just have to make sure that all the information you've put in is correct and then hit finish. Okay, so now that we've created our project, we're presented with the Vivado integrated design environment. On the right here, we have the project summary, and this just provides us with some basic information about our project. On the left, we have our sources. We haven't got anything here yet because we haven't specified anything, but uh, design sources is where our Verilog files that describe our hardware will be. Constraints will be where we store our constraints file. And of course, our simulation sources directory will be where we store anything related to simulation. Down the bottom here, we have some other useful information, including a console. Uh, but what's really, really important down here is the messages tab, which is where our errors and warnings and other useful information will appear during uh, our designs and also reports. So 
once we in synthesize our design and implement it, we'll be able to access you know, useful information regarding things like resource usage, uh, power consumption, and also timing uh, resources. So this reports tab can be very, very useful when we start working with more complicated designs. On the very far left, we have what is called the flow navigator. This flow, uh, sorry, follows the a typical design flow for FPGA development, uh, where basically we can add sources, uh, access language templates, uh, or even access Silinx's IP catalog, which is basically just a library of uh, pre-existing modules that you can implement in your designs. Um, we're not really going to worry with IP integrator um, too much or RTL analysis, uh, but these are useful tools for creating code using block diagrams or exploring how Xilinx actually interprets your design uh, in terms of logic functions. So typically what happens in you know, FPGA development is you'll create a design source and then you'll simulate it. And so you know, when we simulate it, we're just checking that the behavior is as expected. Once we're finished with running our simulations, um, we'll run synthesis, implementation, and then if everything is correct and everything is fine, we'll then go ahead and generate what is called a bitstream. So synthesis is important because it translates whatever code you write into, you know, logic functions. And so, you know, we don't, we don't call it compiling in this case, we call it synthesis. Uh, however, I will use the terms interchangeably, but we're not compiling a program in the context of software development. We're synthesizing a design. And so the code that we write describes the behavior of the hardware, the actual FPGA. And when we synthesize it, it's translating your code into a logic uh, equivalent. Implementation is important because once it takes, once the design has been synthesized, it then has to be placed and routed on the physical FPGA. And implementation is where it's very, very important that you specify the correct project part. If, for example, we were targeting the Nexus 4 DDR, but you had an incorrect project part, so let's say we were targeting a, a smaller FPGA, then it's the implementation tools wouldn't be able to, well, if you, try, it, it would implement it, but then when you, when it came time to target your particular FPGA with it, it would be expecting a completely different chip. And so it wouldn't work. And that's why it's absolutely crucial that you make sure that this is the correct model number. The generate bitstream is the final step in, uh, in, a, in the design process. This is what converts all of your work into a single file that is then downloaded onto the FPGA to program it. So the first thing we're gonna do is create a design source. So you can go ahead and right click on design sources and go add sources. You'll be presented with this window and you can create or add constraints, design sources or simulation sources. Um, we're gonna start with creating a design source. So when we get to this window, um, you'll notice that there's a couple of options, add files, directories, or create file. We don't have any existing source files, so we're just gonna create our file from scratch. The window that pops up will ask you to specify a file type. Uh, in this case, we're using Verilog. Uh, we will not be using VHDL during this course. Um, and the other two options are you know, not really that important to understand right now. Um, except system Verilog, which is a superset of Verilog. The name of our source in this project is going to be switch to LED. And I always change the file location to somewhere, you know, reasonable. I don't like storing files local to my project just because it's harder for me to keep track of them. So I'm going to store my design sources in this directory FPGA uh, and then a subdirectory called sources. So once we've created our file, we can go finish and another window will pop up, which allows us to define our module. So this is where we can declare inputs and outputs to the module. And in this case, what we're doing is designing a, uh, an FPGA program that will illuminate an LED when we activate a slide switch. 
So I'm going to create a port name called slide switch and it's an input and it's a single bit. So I don't need to declare a bus and then I'm going to declare an output and I'm going to call that LED. Once you've declared all your IO ports for that module, you can go ahead and click OK. So you'll notice up here in sources that switch to LED.V has appeared under design sources. If you double click on that, it'll open up in the text editor. So the file that appears uh, starting from the top has this line here that says timescale 1ns slash 1ps. This isn't really relevant right now. This is useful for simulation, um, but for now we can ignore it. The lines that follow are just file information. So you can put in, for example, your name here. Um, you could put your company. You could put a whole bunch of other crap, but right now I actually think it's more of a distraction, so I'm gonna delete it. Okay, so what we've got here is a module declaration. And so this module keyword basically says that the following code is a module and it's called switch to LED. For some reason our output is missing, but I can just add it in like this. And it was called LED. Uh, but this just declares the different inputs and outputs of our module. Uh, because we're creating a light switch, there's only one input slide switch and there's only one output LED. Okay. So this is where we start describing the physical behavior of the FPGA. Uh, what we're doing in this design is essentially creating a wire between the slide switch and the LED through the FPGA chip. And the way that we're going to do this is to basically assign LED to be equal to whatever slide switch is. Now that we've done that, if we went to compile this design or synthesize this design, it nothing would work. Uh, and the reason for that is that we haven't told the synthesis tools where slide switch is or where LED is. And so it's important for us now to do what's called uh, constraining our design. And so what we'll do is we'll quickly create a constraints file. So we don't have an existing ex constraints file, so we're just gonna create one. The file type is XDC, that stands for Xilinx Design Constraint. And the file name will be something useful. Uh, so switch to LED Nexus 4 DDR constraints. Uh, the reason this is such a detailed name is because the constraints file really does belong to a project um, and it also definitely belongs to the particular board that you're targeting. So I'm gonna also go ahead and save this file into my constraints directory. Okay, we'll finish. You'll now notice that a constraints file has appeared under the constraints directory. If you double click on that, it'll open it up, but there will be no information in it. So the thing with constraints files is that they define, or that at least they inform the synthesis and implementation tools uh, about where different signals are coming in and out of the FPGA. So on the bottom of the FPGA, there are 324 pins on this particular one. And what's important for us is to, to route the slide switch, which, to figure out which pin that connects um, to on the FPGA, and then also figure out what pin and assign the pin of the LED. So this, this is a little bit you know, tricky, but what we need to do is basically set some properties for these signals. And so what we're effectively doing is connecting our slide switch and our LED up to physical pins on the FPGA. So the way we do this is using a um, constraints file. In this particular case, the language is called tickle and it's a command-based language, which basically means that we, we set commands. So 
I'm going to set the property of what is called a package pin. And if you look closely at the Nexus 4 DDR, you'll notice that it is the slide switch is connected to pin J15. And what we can do is actually just connect that into slide switch using this code here. So set property is the command. The property that we're setting is the package pin. The value that we're assigning that property is J15. And then this next bit here, everything inside square brackets in tickle is interpreted as a function. So this function get ports is going to search our top level module, which in this case is switch to LED for signals or inputs and outputs called slide switch. And so you can see that the, the input here is slide switch. So that's fine. So we can also do the same thing for the LED. Except now the LED, if you look at the data sheet, is connected to pin H17. And of course it's called LED. Excellent. Okay, so we've set the pin locations for both the switch and the LED, but now we have to do something else. And that is to set what is called an IO standard. And the reason why this is important is because the FPGA is going to interpret whatever voltages it receives uh, using various CMOS or LVDS standards. So we can see from the data sheet that the slide switch is actually connected to a 3.3 volt power rail. And what that means is that when the slide switch is in the on position, it will connect a 3.3 volt signal into the input um, pin. Um, and then when it's in the off position, it will be pulled down to ground. So what we can do is set the property and it's called IO standard to LV CMOS 3.3 and that stands for low voltage CMOS 3.3 and then of course we'll apply this function get ports to slide switch. Now we're done. All the information that is required in order to connect our design to that particular slide switch is complete. The last thing we need to do is specify the IO standard for the LED. And this is a little bit more complicated because it's not an input, which means we're not informing the implementation tools what kind of voltage to expect. Instead, we're really informing it uh, what kind of what voltage standard we want it to drive at. So if you look at the data sheet, you'll notice that there are anode connected resistors just after the LED. And the reason these resistors are there is because LEDs are non-ohmic. That just means they have effectively no resistance. So if we were to drive the LED with any voltage without any anode connected resistor, then the amount of current drawn by that circuit would be huge. Uh, you can resolve that in your head by thinking of Ohm's law, which is V equals IR, and therefore the current I is equal to the voltage divided by the resistance. And if the resistance is very low, then the current will be very, very high. So there's a resistor there. And in this particular design, it is a 330 ohm resistor. The reason it has that particular value is because it's trying to limit the current that can flow through that circuit uh, to within the acceptable range of the LED. So in this case, the LED can accept probably between, well, anywhere up to about 20 milliamps. So we can get away with setting the IO standard of the LED to LV CMOS 33, uh, which will generate a 3.3 volt signal on the output of the FPGA. Um, and then if you divide 3.3 volts by 330 ohms, you'll re you know, end up with a result of 10 milliamps. And so that is why when you're setting the IO standard of an output, you have to you know, actually think about it. You can't just look at the data sheet and see what rail it's connected to. You could, for example, connect the LED up 
with a 1.8 volt signal or a 2.5 volt signal or 5 volt signal, it's not really a problem. Um, but you should think about what that would mean in terms of the brightness of the LED. You know, if we put more voltage uh, onto it, then we'd be allowing more current to flow. And you would think that the LED would therefore be a little bit brighter. Okay. So now that everything's finished, it looks like we are ready to generate a bitstream. Okay, so I'm just checking the code to make sure that there are no obvious issues. We've got one input called slide switch. We've got one output called LED. Um, all of our set properties in the constraints file are correct. Okay, it looks like we're ready to basically run synthesis. So synthesizing this design is trivial because we're legitimately just producing a wire. So we're, we're, we're telling the FPGA, I know that you're really fancy, uh, but really all I want you to do is give me a physical wire connection from this pin, J15, to this other pin, H17. And the synthesizer is not going to have a lot of difficulty achieving that. But we'll wait for it nonetheless. Excellent. So synthesis is now completed. And, you know, there's a couple of options that you can um, select here, but we're just going to go ahead and run implementation. So you'll notice here in the messages window down the bottom that two warnings have popped up. And I'm going to quickly look at them just to make sure I know what they are. Ah, okay. So design switch to LED has an empty top module. I'm not sure why this pops up, but it's probably to do with the fact that we only have one module in the entire uh, design. And that module is called uh, switch to LED. If we had more modules, then what we would be able to do is right click and it's grayed out now, but we could set as top. Uh, and what that does is says, says to the implementation tools, this is the top module. Uh, and that's important because when the implementation tools come along and try to connect physical inputs and outputs in the top module to pins on the FPGA, it's going to look at whatever is declared as the top module. So right now you can see at the top right, we have a current status of what's actually going on. Uh, the implementation tools are haven't thrown any warnings at this point, uh, but running route design, what this is actually doing is now figuring out how to create a wire from pin J15 to pin H17. And it obviously didn't have too much difficulty doing that. Uh, if it did, I'd be very concerned. Okay, so the options here, we can open our implemented design uh, or we can generate a bitstream. So I'm just going to go straight ahead and generate a bitstream. Oh, by the way, you don't need to really worry about these options here. Uh, the launch runs on localhost. It's, it's basically saying, you know, just run four parallel tasks on this particular computer. Uh, but, you know, you don't need to worry about any of the other options. Okay, so now it's currently writing the bitstream. And this is the the good part because it produces a, f a file called a bitstream. Uh, it'll be a, it'll have the file extension dot bit, and that is the file that we will end up programming our FPJ with. And it doesn't fortunately take very long to do. So uh, in this case, I expected the uh, the longest uh, part of the of the um, of the build process to be implementation. Um, but really, you know, for more complicated designs, synthesis could be, you know, take quite a while. Um, but generally implementation is what takes the most time. Okay. So bit stream generation has successfully completed. This is good. The options that are available to us, um, we don't need to worry about them too much, but if you wanted to actually look at the, the actual design that Vivado has, or that the, the routing tools have figured out through the FPGA, you could open the implemented design. You can also view reports, uh, but we can also do that from the bottom menu here. Um, 
You can also generate a memory configuration file. Don't worry about that right now. Uh, and what we are actually gonna do is because we just wanna program our board straight away, we're gonna open the hardware manager. Okay, so you'll notice that the window has changed now. So we are now connected, to, well, opened into hardware manager and what we need to do to start with is open a target. So this is where you need to make sure that you have a USB connection between your FPGA board and your computer. Uh, if you're using a Nexus 4 DDR or a Basis 3, then you wanna make sure that the device is powered on as well. Once you've done that, just select open target and then hit auto connect. And what this will do is establish a connection uh, to your FPGA board. Uh, I think it is creating a, uh, like an, like an ethernet over a USB connection. Uh, local host is the computer. Uh, and then the Xilinx underscore TCF is the actual board. Okay, so this is good. This means that we have a connection between the computer and the board. Uh, now all that's left to do is to program the device. So really at this stage, everything's looking fantastic. Uh, you just need to make sure that it's going to load the correct bitstream file. So in this case, because our top module is called switch to LED, the bit, the bit file is uh, called the same thing, except the file extension is different. The file extension is .bit. So once you've checked that that file is correct, you can go ahead and program your device. You should notice when you do this that whatever default program was running when you first turned the Nexus 4 um, board on will stop, it'll cease. Uh, and now if you flick that LED on, it'll turn on. And that is essentially uh, the most over-engineered light switch you will ever design in your life. Thank you.